In the preceding videos, we've learned that heteroscedasticity and autocorrelated errors distort our model. So what do we do if one of our assumptions is violated? Does that mean that we have to scrap our entire model? Well, no, and it happens more often than you think. Um, the first thing we have to do is state which assumptions are violated. This is a must do. You need to inform the reader about what you're actually doing. It really isn't a big problem if you have to adjust your model. A lot of econometric studies do that. You just have to tell the reader why you're doing what you're doing. So a lot of the times we need to account for heteroscedastistic or serial correlated errors. But how do we actually do this? Well, there are two general, or basically there are two general approaches. The first thing you could do is, is estimate a generalized least squares model. Or more precisely, you could estimate a uh, weighted least squares model, especially if you want to account for heteroscedasticity. And um, weighted least squares model is a model within the group of generalized least squares models. So basically, there's not the generalized least squares model. Um, WLS is a generalized least squares model. Okay? But, and this is very, very important, this is more old fashioned. And to my knowledge, this is not done in modern papers. So actually, just scrap that, okay? It's not done anymore. Um, actually, if you do your own research on that topic, you'll get pretty weird answers. So, for example, the textbook I'm using, it's Woolrich Introductory Econometrics, A Modern Approach. By the way, this is a great book, and I suggest you take a look into that, since I was using that book for the last videos. Anyway, this textbook talks about using GLS models, but in the end of the chapter, and I'm using edition 5, so a fairly new version of the book, it tells you that today people tend to use other methods. So why still talk about the old techniques? So what is the other techniques that people today are using? Well, remember what the problem was when we are violating the assumptions of homoscedasticity and no serial correlation. The regression line is pointing into the right direction, therefore, we have, um, therefore our estimates are not biased. But our standard errors are too narrow. Well, most of the time. So what we need are so-called robust standard errors. So we need robust standard robust standard errors. This is what we need. But how do we get them? Well, normally I would say that R is the best. But this time, and only this time, I'm tipping my head to stator. In stator, um, you just had to add the option robust to your regression command. And it's a bit more complicated in R, but still, it's very manageable. So um, there's a fantastic R package that is called Sandwich. I know it's a funny name, but that's the name. So Sandwich is the package we are interested in. And I would so also to suggest that you read the manual of that package and another um, great paper I put into the description of this video, since it gives a great introduction into robust standard errors. And what we actually want are, in order to uh, calculate these standard errors, are what we call HAC estimates. So we need HAC estimates. And HAC stands for heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation consistent estimates. And uh, the so-called, and I'll write that down, Newey, Newey REST procedure um, produces these HAC estimates. Um, that means they control for heteroscedasticity and serial correlation at the same time. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Um, you might also remember that serial correlated errors are pretty common in time series regression. So if you ever need to, uh, if you ever need robust standard errors in time series context, go ahead and use the Newey West standard errors. So if you're using time series data, Newey West is the way to go for. Okay, so this is perfect for time series data. Okay. Um, when it comes to cross-sectional data, you might be more interested in only controlling for heteroscedasticity. And um, we are therefore looking for, and let me get an, another color, we are looking for HC estimates, okay? This should be a capital C. We need HC estimates. Um, basically, there are five different estimators in the sandwich package we can choose from in order to get HC estimators. Well, the first one is called HCO, the second one HC1, 
HC2, some space over here, HC3, and the last one is called HC4, okay? These are the names of our estimators. Now, what estimator should we choose? Well, HCO um, is the standard estimator that was proposed by White. It's a pretty old one. Look at this. This is the classical one, okay? Um, HC1, HC2, and HC3, these over here, they were suggested by McKinnon and White to pr improve the performance in small samples. And actually, Long and Irvin showed in a paper that um, the uh, HC3 estimate um, is the best from all of these. So I would say go ahead and use HC3 as your default. Okay, so this, this should be your default. And by the way, this is the default in the sandwich package. So um, if you're working with small samples, you might want to check these out, okay? Um, then there's HC4, and this is the newest estimator of them all, and it further improves small sample performance. Okay, so let's recap. If you're using time series data and want HAC estimators, you can, um, you can, you can account for he uh, heteroscedasticity and um, autocorrelation with the Newey West standard errors. Okay, this is perfect for time series data. Um, if you're using cross-sectional data, you most likely only want to account for heteroscedasticity, and therefore you could use either the HCO, HC1, HC2, HC3, or HC4 um, estimators. So this is perfect for cross-sectional data. Okay, perfect for cross-sectional data. Um, again, you should take a look into the sandwich package description and most importantly, you should read the uh, document I put into the, um, I put into the uh, comment section of this video.